good evening and welcome all of you to Take Webinar Nepal 12th series. So Take Webinar Nepal is basically an online platform where they share knowledge about technologies to uh, take enthusiasts such as team leaders, project managers, software developers, programmers, and all those individuals out there who are determined and passionate to learn about technological stuff. So, uh, well, you all know that without any hands of supporters, the event is impossible to conduct. So we have our supporters who are Microsoft Nepal. We would like to provide our sincere gratitude to us, Mr. Dipendra Bajracharya. Next, we have our media partner as Take Pathro and Living with ICT. So Take Pathro is a startup company from Biratnagar, Nepal, whereas Living with ICT, they publish um, magazines which is related with technological stuffs. Next, we have our community partner as Facebook Developers Circle. They are from Kathmandu. Uh, moving on, today we have our four speakers uh, who will be talking about .NET Core. So our first speaker is Mr. Scott Hanselman. So Mr. Scott Hanselman is a principal community architect for web platform and tools uh, for Microsoft. So he will be talking about .NET Core. Secondly, we have Jeremy Likeness who will be talking on Blazor and he's a senior cloud advocate and developer relation manager at uh, Microsoft. Likewise, we have Mr. Roshan Bhattrai, who is a Chief Technological Officer and Co-Founder at uh, ProShore. And last but not the least, we have Mr. Session Philip, who will be talking on uh, realworld.net. So these are the four speakers for today's session. So without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Scott Hanselman. All, to, all over to you, Mr. Um, Scott. My name is Scott Hanselman, and I'm here in Portland, Oregon. And right now, you can see in the corner of my computer screen, it is actually, let's see if we can zoom in here, five in the morning. Can you see that? So I'm up early, but you're up late here on Tech Webinar. I'm happy to spend time with you today. And I'm going to be talking about .NET, .NET Core, specifically .NET Core 3.1 and the future of .NET. Can you see my screen there, I hope? I'm gonna to try to show you as many tech demonstrations as I can, and um, I will take uh, notes uh, from our friends in Kathmandu there who have any questions. You can always find me on Twitter. My chat is S. Hanselman, Scott Hanselman. I'm always on Twitter and you can find me also at my blog. And I also have a podcast, which is a great way to stay up on technology. My podcast is Hansel Minutes, so you can learn about .NET and other technologies at HanselMinutes.com. All right, so I'm gonna spend a few moments here in Notepad. I know it's an unusual way to do a presentation, but I think it's a good way to start. Um, when we think about .NET, that name .NET, what do we think about? Right now, we usually think about Windows. We think about the .NET framework, specifically .NET 4.6, 7, 8. And we think about C Sharp. That has been the way that we have thought about .NET for the longest time. But we now have .NET Core. And .NET Core 3.1 has just been released, just been released a few weeks ago. And .NET Core is now what do we call an LTS or long-term support version. And this is really, really important for companies and technologists to understand because LTS means that you're gonna have three full years minimum of support or .NET Core. And .NET Core isn't just Windows. It's actually Windows, Mac, it's Linux, it's Docker, it's things like a Raspberry Pi, the little tiny computer. It's not just C Sharp, but it's also F Sharp and VB and other languages. 
So the thing that's important to understand about .NET Core is that it's open source and really that it runs anywhere. And this is very different. This is a very different change from the way .NET has happened for the last 20 years or so. Now this can be a, uh, a confusing change to some people because for so many years, .NET has only run on Windows and .NET has only been C Sharp. But I'm gonna give a few demos here about why this is important and uh, hopefully this will make sense. And I'm assuming that everybody can see my, my, my screen here, okay? So I'm gonna jump out to the command line. I happen to be using the, uh, the Windows terminal. And I know it's kind of strange to do demos at the command line, but I think it's important for people to understand uh, the lower level, the low level. I could go into Visual Studio and I could say file new project and spend time in Visual Studio, but I think sometimes that hides uh, complexity. I think it's more interesting to look at things at the lower level. So I'm gonna make a folder here. We'll just call it Nepal. And right now you can see that it is an empty folder. There's nothing in there, okay? And when we go and ask the command line, where is .NET? You'll notice something here. It says it is in program files .NET. Now remember before when we talk about .NET full framework, we talk about the Windows folder and it's in Microsoft.net. So if we look right here, I have a folder here. C Windows.net, and it's got the versions of .NET that have been around for the last 20 years. That tells you that .NET is very reliable, it's been around forever, and it will be around forever. But this version, the .NET full framework, is specific to Windows, all right? Only runs on Windows. It's actually become part of Windows, but this .NET is actually located in C program files. That's very interesting. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say push D or push directory, I'm gonna save this directory, and I'm gonna go over to that folder. So now I'm in the program files.net folder, and I'm then just gonna go and say start, and that's gonna go and launch the, uh, that's gonna go and launch Explorer, and that drops me into here. Look at this. Now we're not on C colon windows, we're in program files.net, and look at this, we've got a whole bunch of .NETs. That's really interesting. Even, we've got a preview.NET in here. We've got older .NETs, lots of different ones. Well, this is important to understand because with the original version of .NET that we were talking about a moment ago, the one that comes with Windows, in fact, you can't have what's called side-by-side. -side. You can't run your .NET applications side-by-side. -side. You can only run .NET 4, .NET 4.8 applications. And if I go and I upgrade my computer and put a new version of .NET on it, unfortunately, everything comes forward and ends up running on .NET 4. What's cool about this is if I say .NET version, you see it says .NET 3.1. Let's go back to the Nepal folder. I wanna point out that it's empty. And you see that I'm in .NET 3.1. I'm going to say .NET new, and I'm going to say global JSON. I'm going to make a new file. You can see now I have a small file here. And let's open that file up. And that file actually has a version number right there. You see? You're going to say change that to .NET 2.1, not 3.1. Okay. Oops. Now, look at that. So when I'm in the Nepal folder, I'll do that again. When I'm in the Nepal folder, I've got 2.1. When I'm in another folder, I've got 3.1. This is so important to understand. It's a small demonstration, but it's a really, really important demonstration because what it says is it's telling me that 
In this folder, I have scoped.net to the latest version, but in that Nepal folder, I can go and run this version of .NET. That means that a programmer who works at a company can have lots of different versions of .NET and .NET Core on the machine, and they don't have to worry about them um, conflicting with each other. Okay. So what's cool about that is I'm going to go ahead and delete that global JSON, say .NET version, and look, I'm back to .NET 3.1. Okay. So that's super interesting. What we can do now is say .NET new, and that's going to give me a list of all of the different technologies that we can do with .NET. I'll do that again to make it clear. .NET new. These are all different things that I can potentially say new for. Now, of course, Jeremy is going to talk about Blazor. And we've got things like WPF, the Windows Presentation Foundation. I can make Angular or React applications. I can do lots of different stuff with uh, .NET Core. For the purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to make mostly console apps because it's the most general application. But I want to make it clear that I can make any kinds of applications, including lots of different ASP.NET apps. Now, when I say .NET new here, that's the same as if I went into Visual Studio and I said I want to make a new project. And look, same kind of thing. I can make a console app, an ASP.NET app, Windows Forms. It's just the difference between using Visual Studio and using that command line. All right. So, back to the command line again. And we say .NET new console. So we're going to make a console application. Here we've just created this little tiny application. And I'm going to go and open it. And again, I'm just using Notepad because I want to show people what happens at the low level. Lots of people can use Visual Studio. Lots of people can hide complexity from themselves. But it is always nice to be reminded what's happening down. Uh, at the text file level. So here is that application. And I'm going to change hello world. OK, and I'll save that. And now what I'm going to do is type .NET. Run. And let's see if it's fast. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000. That was not too fast. I'll try that again. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000. It was about two seconds. It sometimes can be as long as four seconds, which I think can be frustrating because some people will try out .NET and they'll find that they feel that that application doesn't run very fast. Well, in fact, when they're saying .NET run, they're actually doing a whole series of operations. This is the list of things that the .NET command line can do, like build, clean, or run. And you'll notice here that when I said .NET run, it actually builds and runs the application. So when I said that, I was actually saying .NET build, which runs a whole build process. It also implies a .NET restore, there's a lot of stuff going on there, and it created this bin folder. I'm going to go into that bin folder and into that folder below it and keep going down until I find something. Aha! Look at that. I found that executable. I found an executable. So let's try running that. Instead of running .NET run, I'm going to run Nepal.exe. And here, see how fast that is? That runs very quickly because that is already compiled. But here's an interesting thing. That seems a little bit big and that seems a little bit small. What's really going on here? What is that executable? What if I deleted that? Just deleted. You can see Nepal.exe is now gone. And now I've got this little Nepal 
uh, DLL. This DLL right here. This DLL. Hang on one moment. I'm just going to check my sound and make sure that everything sounds OK. I'll put my headphones on to ensure that things sound good to you, my friends. There we go. All right. So this Nepal.exe, I can run like this. Paul.dll rather. Look at that. So I deleted that. See that? I deleted that executable, which is very interesting, and I can run Nepal.dll. Now, why do you care? Why do you care? Well, again, it's important to understand that when we went and we said build, let's go back up again. I'm going to save this directory. I'm going to say push D, pushing that directory back on the stack. Okay. Then I'm going to go back up to this folder and I'm going to do a build again. So I just did a build. And now I'm going to go back down. That Nepal.exe, that larger file, that may not be what we think it is, in fact. Well, remember at the beginning when we said this, we said where.net exe, and we saw this. Why don't we go and look at that folder? Refamiliarize ourselves with it. There's a little tiny executable there it's all alone in a folder and there's nothing else there and it happens to be suspiciously about 150k right and this one's about 160k well in fact that nepal.exe is an updated copy of this with a little bit of extra information because what we're doing here is making it easy for people to run their application but where's the logic where's the actual logic for our application well let's do this let's run a cool application called il spy okay il spy is the intermediate language spy what does that mean well Let's switch back over to Notepad because I want to explain this very briefly and then we'll go and see the insides of our application. When you take your C sharp, I think as we hopefully as we know, but if we don't know, you're actually not compiling it into an exe or DLL. First, it gets turned into a thing called intermediate language. IL intermediate language. And it is that intermediate language that lives inside of that DLL. That's a little bit different from C++ and C. And we can look at that intermediate language when we go and take one of these applications like ILSpy. So let's go and run ILSpy. And what I'm going to do is open. And this is an open source application. Everything that I'm showing you is open source. This is really, really important. Um, you need to remember that everything I'm showing you is free. Everything I'm showing you is open source and can be downloaded and can be run uh, basically anywhere. OK. I'm going to say open. I'm going to go to my desktop and we'll find that Nepal folder. And we'll go into the bin. There we go. Look at this. So I'm going to open Nepal.exe. And when we open it up, we see a couple of things. We see a reference to system.console. 
and this system dot runtime. Now system dot console is coming out of this folder. Look at that. It's not a Windows thing. It's actually in the dot net folder that implies that it could potentially run anywhere, which is super important. We want to be able to run these things anywhere. OK, so this folder is where the actual work is happening. Nepal.dll. Now remember at the very beginning we talked about .NET and then we talked about .NET Core. This can be a little bit confusing, but when we say .NET, when we talk about .NET with our with our bosses and with our colleagues, when we say, hey, look, this is in .NET, what does that really mean? Well, it's a marketing term. And that can be confusing because it's not necessarily a technology term. There are multiple .NETs, and I'm going to say that with it in plural, .NETs, plural. There's .NET framework. That's on Windows. There's .NET Core, Mac, Windows, Linux, etc. And then what's another .NET? Mono. So what's Mono and why do we care? Well, we created this Nepal.dll and the intermediate language that's inside it looks like this. There's another cool application that I can find called ILDASM. And that will let us see this as well. We're going to go and grab that folder one more time. Look inside. And there it is. That's not C sharp, that's intermediate language. You can see here it says load string. And then it goes and it calls system.console.writeline. So why am I spending time at the low level here? Because it's important to remember that when you create .NET code, it doesn't know what operating system it's going to run on. It could run on Linux, it could run on Mac, it might run in the cloud, it could run on an iPhone. The fact that it doesn't know that is really important. So what's mono and why do we care? Well, what if, I went like this. I just opened up the mono command prompt and I'm going to go into that Nepal folder. OK. And let's go find that DLL again. There it is. Now watch carefully. I'm going to say mono. Nepal.dll. And it runs. So let's just pause for a second because that can be very confusing, but it's really, really interesting from a computer science perspective. Mono is a .NET, right? This is one, this is one, and this is one. And Mono is an, is an open source re-implementation, meaning that someone made it over again. Mono is another .NET. It's not a Microsoft .NET. It's a completely open source .NET that's been around for many, many years. In fact, there's other smaller .NETs that you may not have heard of, but these are the three primary ones. Now the question is, how was I able to go and run a .NET application that I compiled and created with .NET Core 3? But then I went and was able to go and run it with mono. That's because of that intermediate language, that intermediate language that sits between Nepal.dll and the metal. Now, this is very small. In fact, we've got less than 200K here. There's not a lot going on there. And when we went and we ran our IL spy, we looked inside our application. There were 
all kinds of references like system.console. And that came out of here. Out of C program files dot net shared dot net core app. Well, let's look in that folder. Oh my goodness, look at this. There's 200 items in here. This might look like a lot. In fact, it's not too many because they're very small. You can see that they're in fact very, very small. But when you add them all up, they might be bigger than we think. It ends up being about 65 megabytes. Not too bad. What's interesting about this, though, is that these are the .NET runtimes for Windows. And we can go to our application and we can compile it into a single location that we can then share. And I can give it to you, even though you may not have .NET installed. So let's do that. So remember when we said .NET, that's our command line. I can say .NET help. One of the choices is publish. Let's remind ourselves that the ones we've been using so far, build, run, and publish. So that's interesting. .NET publish help. There's all kind of stuff going on here. I can make a self-contained publish. Remember that folder didn't have a lot of things in there. We're going to say .NET publish. We're going to publish it for Windows 10, which is what I'm using. So I just said .NET publish. And I said, I want to do it for Windows 10. Now let's go into that folder. Aha, look at this. It's the same Nepal application from before and the rest of .NET. That's super interesting. What this means and why this is important for the business person is that I can then give you this folder. I can give you this published folder, about 65 megs, and then you can run that .NET application on any Windows machine without having to install anything. That means that suddenly the dependencies are gone. Now remember at the very beginning of the conversation when I was showing you different versions of .NET, we're actually shipping in this case, in this folder for our little application, the Nepal.exe, which we can run. I'll go right there, in fact. And it runs entirely locally without having to install anything, without anyone needing to understand anything. However, I look at that and I say, well, you know, that's still got a bunch of stuff. It's still kind of uh, a little bit big. And I don't want to have the user see all these things. This is stressing me out. I'd like them to just get an application. So what can we do to make that simpler? Back to our main folder right here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say .NET publish, just like we did before, for Windows 10. And I could say Windows 10 or Linux or whatever. I'll show you that in a little bit. And I'm going to say I want not a folder, but I want, in fact, a single file. This is new stuff. This is new in .NET Core 3. This is very exciting, and it's going to only get better. So let's go and look in that folder again. And I'm going to actually delete this folder and do it again because I want you to see everything happen at once. Boop. You see that? Look at this. Now things are super interesting. We do have 
that Nepal EXE. It's only 60 megs. It's the beginning of our application. In this case, it's just hello world. But in the future, it could have all kinds of things, microservices or whatever. And I can then give someone that and it will work anywhere. So I can just give them what's inside this folder. They can run that. It'll do a hello world. And everything is entirely self-contained, which is super cool. Now this is running inside of the Windows terminal and I happen to be again running on uh, on Windows 10. So when I'm running Nepal.exe, I'm running the, the Windows version of that. Um, but I can also run Ubuntu. What I happen to be running right here is the Windows subsystem for Linux. So I'm not sure how many people are familiar with this. I'm going to close a few windows and we'll talk about that for a second because this is another thing that's very, very important to understand and it gives you an information about what's coming uh, in the space. So I'm running WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux, and this is included with Windows 10. You probably already have this. In fact, if you go and to the Windows features options here in Windows. You probably have this. You maybe just didn't turn this on. If you have a version of Windows 10 that you have been using uh, for a couple of years, this allows you to run a full version of Linux on Windows. So why would a .NET developer care about that and why is that important? Well, I'd like to be able to test my .NET application out here in Linux world without having to worry about firing up a, a virtual machine or anything like that. So here in my Windows terminal, and again, the Windows terminal is, is free and open source. I've got PowerShell, DOS, Ubuntu. This is a separate system, but it's totally local and it's totally fast. And if I say .NET dash dash version, you can see here I've got 3.1. But if I ask it where .NET is, because we're in Ubuntu, it's not in program files, right? It's in user bin, which is a different location, of course, because we're on a on a Linux machine. OK, so if we go into bin, we look at .NET. right there that then is installed in share .net. I was like I think don't think I'm actually able to get to that there we go see and this is that same .net that we saw before except the Linux parts now this is where things get really really interesting I think because I'm on Linux uh, we can make uh, a folder here. We'll do our Nepal thing again. Nepal. .net new console. This one will say hello world. I did not change it yet. Okay. But if I say, oops. There you go. If I say .net publish. Maybe from here I would say Linux x64 rather than Windows x64. Say look, and then this folder here, and I'm going to go. This is actually kind of cool. So we're in Linux. We're in this folder right here. I'm going to say explorer.exe. And that's actually going to go and run. Look at that. That just ran Windows Explorer. And now I can see those files. These are actually the Linux files. <clears throat> as viewed on my local network. In that bin debug folder. And here is in fact. The Linux executable. 
and that nepal.dll. Now remember that we talked about that intermediate language. This is really important because we can run this anywhere, right? It is that intermediate language that allows .NET to run anywhere. And that's why things are so interesting. And in a little while, when I'm finished talking, Jeremy will talk about Blazor and WebAssembly and that idea of portability around .NET. It's so important and it's such a very different way of thinking about things when you compare it to the way that we thought about things before when .NET framework was, was Windows only. But .NET Core is literally anywhere. That's very important. And it's that fundamental thing. It's that big change and the change is, of course, open source. The .NET Core is open source. And as I mentioned before, and it's worth reminding ourselves that .NET Core 3.1 uh, is now long-term support. And that means that companies can use it right now. In fact, uh, Bing Stack Overflow itself is actually .NET uh, and is running on .NET 3.1, which is not that hard uh, to, uh, to implement. So over here in Linux world, I'm able to do this development as well. So I'm on a Windows machine and I can quickly move back and forth between Windows and Linux and I can spend my time editing this application and making sure that it runs anywhere. In fact, I could go and run Visual Studio Code directly from Linux. It's now going to launch in Windows. This is new as well. And look in the lower left corner here. That Visual Studio Code knows that it's running on the Windows subsystem for Linux. It knows which one. And what it just did is very interesting. It's actually splitting in half. And half of it runs in Linux. And half of it will run in Windows. Okay. So right here, I just said console dot to try to get IntelliSense, and you'll notice that nothing happened because under the extensions area here, we don't have anything installed. I could go and search for C Sharp, install that extension, okay? We're gonna install that extension inside of Linux, inside of Linux. And we're going to have some of our extensions inside and some outside. Look, look at that. Installing C Sharp dependencies on Linux. Installing the packages, bringing the debugger down, a thing called Omni Sharp. There we go. So now look at this. We've got our local extensions, the ones I have on Windows. In fact, I have 35 of them. And then in Linux, we have just one, C Sharp. And what that's going to enable me to do is be on Windows where I'm comfortable. I just typed console, and when I hit console dot, you'll note that it pops up IntelliSense. Where is that IntelliSense coming from? Well, that's actually coming from Linux. Linux did the work there. In fact, when I open up the terminal here, this is that same folder. So now this is really interesting. Let's take a moment and think about this. We are, I'm gonna write this down in Notepad because it can be confusing. Where's my Notepad? Here we go. Let's think about this. So I've been going pretty fast. We are on Windows 10, VS Code or Visual Studio Code on Windows, to be clear, our .NET, core application is actually on Linux, specifically Ubuntu 18.04. And there's a separation between those things. So we're running Visual Studio Code. Our app is running on Linux, but you can see how, how comfortably I'm able to move back and forth between Windows and Linux. And this allows me to save money from a business perspective. I can host these things in Linux on Linux hosts uh, that are inexpensive. 
uh, whether it be in Azure or somewhere else. And now I'm doing debugging. So can I go and actually mark a breakpoint? And go and do a debug session? Look at that. So now we're doing interactive debugging between Windows and Linux using VS. And again, every single thing that I've shown is free and open source. The stack here is .NET Core. It's VS Code. It's WSL, free and in Windows. Happen to get Ubuntu, which is in the Windows Store. You can just search for Linux if you want to. And the thing that's enabling me to do this remote debugging, this remote extension debugging, is right here. It is Visual Studio Code's remote subsystem extension. It lets you open any folder in Linux and take advantage of that, which is pretty, pretty cool. So now I'm going and doing full debugging from my application. I'm at a breakpoint right now. I could step over and then we see hello world. This is pretty cool because this has allowed me to the applications that I care about, for example, my blog, my podcast, my websites. So if I go to Hanselman.com, and I see my application, these are the applications that I worry about and that I care about. I go down to the bottom here. You can see they're powered by .NET Core 3.1. I want to run those as inexpensively as I can, as cheaply as I can. So I'm going to run them on small Linux machines and sometimes on Docker or in a container. And I want those to run anywhere. I've developed them on, them on Windows and I can run them on Linux and I can test them anywhere. In fact, I've got the source code for those applications right here. So let's go and see something with a little bit more complexity. Let's take a look at my podcast, for example. So this is my podcast. Again, remember that my last name is Hanselman. So the podcast is called Hansel Minutes. It's just 30 minute long show. And I've done hundreds and hundreds of shows, 700 shows plus going back many, many years. This application is also a .NET Core 3.1 application. It's an ASP.NET, what's called a Razor Pages application. And what's interesting here is that it runs on Windows and it runs on Linux, and I've been able to get it to work everywhere without a lot of effort. Now you'll notice a couple of interesting things here. I've made some PS1 scripts. These scripts are very, very simple, but they, they've enabled me to use PowerShell Core as my shell. And PowerShell Core is great because it exists on Linux as well. See here, I'm back over in Linux. I'm in Ubuntu running PowerShell. I can run PowerShell from Windows. So by making my scripts PowerShell scripts, that's enabled me very, very easily to go and build and test and run my application anywhere. Now I can say code dot. I'll go and run Visual Studio Code. And we'll look at the code for the Hansel Minutes podcast application. So this is a real cross-platform application. It actually consists of two main projects, the Hansel Minutes project and the tests project. Testing is really, really important, and I found this to be super interesting and super useful. Let me run a test real quick, and we'll see if these tests pass, because as with all projects, it's been a while and maybe it won't pass. So I'm going to go and run test.ps1. Again, I'm using a PowerShell script. And it's going to start, look, it's going to run 
See that box that just opened? It's called Selenium. And Selenium is going to launch Chrome. And if you'll notice right here, it says Chrome is being controlled by automated test software. That's interesting. So let's see it. Look, it's actually launching Chrome. I'm not moving the mouse. And look, it's actually, look, I found a broken test. That's good. It broke a test. It's loading my application, checking for different stuff. Looks like I might have a bug. It's running multiple tests. So look at that. So we've got 23 tests, 22 passed, and one test failed. That's interesting. Well, what happened was it expected it to say Hanselman, it's podcast by Scott Hanselman. And instead, it got a Hanselman, it's podcast. And then look, a carriage return and a line feed. So that came back. And then it gives me the line 128. So Selenium tests 128. Let's go and look at that, fix that. Selenium tests, line 128. And it says it got a carriage return line feed. So I'm going to change that and we'll run the test again. So we have 23 tests. We wanted to run and work everywhere. I can run these tests as well on Linux to make sure that these things work everywhere. So it's running unit tests and it's also running a full end-to-end -end smoke test by automating Chrome. All the details on how to do this is on my blog and in the documentation. So no worries there. See how Chrome is launching again. I'm not moving the mouse, which is really important to point out. It's just about done. Oh, now look at this. 23 tests. They in fact all passed. And now look at this. I'm getting code coverage. So here you can see that I've got pretty decent code coverage, upwards of 80%. A little bit less with my views. This is using a wonderful application called Coverlet. And Coverlet has printed out this little ASCII table that's telling me how much code coverage that I've got, uh, which means that I've got the vast majority of what's going on in my application completely covered. And you'll see that if I do a git diff, that we see the one change that I made in order to fix my test. And you see this kind of cool prompt here. I've got, again, details on my blog. Um, if you go and search for Hanselman, I think I called it pretty prompt. How to make a pretty prompt in Windows. And I walk through how to make your Windows look that cool as well. I think it looks pretty cool. So this application then can be sent up into Azure DevOps. And I've gone and done that here. So I'm going to sign in to Azure DevOps very briefly as I wrap up. And you can see here I've got both my main website and my Hansel Minutes website running in ASP.NET Core. If we go up and look at the pipeline for this application, there's my Azure pipelines that goes in. You can actually see a build here, uses .NET, downloads .NET 3.1. And this is important, look at this. It's actually using Linux to do the build. So again, just a reminder, even though I'm using Windows to do all my development, I wanna save money, so I'm using Linux in the cloud and I'm able to do all of that build inside of Azure DevOps. And what's exciting about this again, is I'm using the free Azure DevOps. So Azure DevOps pricing, check this out. I'm just using the free version I get 1800 minutes per month, which is really great. And I have not gotten close to using it all up. You can see my build so far. All my builds have succeeded. 
And then when I do a final release to production, my last release to production was just a few days ago. It releases out to Linux. All right. So what's cool about this is I have been able to show you that .NET, dot netting all the things and allow you to run basically anything. I made a console app. I use it for the web. I deploy it out to the cloud, but of course you could certainly use it for mobile or gaming. You can go and make all kinds of applications in .NET and .NET Core. You could use a Raspberry Pi or an IoT device, and you could even do things in ML. Now .NET uh, has already been popular, but .NET Core is extremely popular. .NET Core is actually the fastest growing version that we have uh, with over a million .NET Core developers already. It's been the fastest adopted version that we've had ever before. These are just a few of the customers that are using .NET and .NET Core. I mentioned that Stack Overflow. I'm sure that everyone on the phone has been to Stack Overflow. Not everyone on the phone on the on the webinar here knows that in fact they run .NET Core and .NET Core 3. Uh, these are some US companies like GoDaddy and UPS, and there's millions of customers out there. Uh, Stack Overflow went and migrated up to .NET Core. Now I mentioned before, very important that .NET Core 3.1 is out and supports this side-by-side -side and self-contained executables. Remember that I was able to go and make that Nepal.exe and it would run on Windows without having to install .NET. It just works, which is really, really great. And then I touched a little bit on that web development that I was doing with C Sharp and Razor. Again, it's just a short webinar, so I can spend hours and hours showing you this stuff, but there's lots more details on my blog, on Jeremy's blog, on Cecil's blog, on the, the Microsoft documentation as well. Um, the ASP.NET Core 3 stuff that I showed is really, really great for microservices, for small applications. If you're starting to move your application from a monolithic environment up to uh, these smaller independent services that could then go and run potentially in Azure or wherever you want to go. And of course, if you want to run the latest version of C Sharp, you're going to want to do that on .NET Core. .NET Core 3.0 is the version that supports the latest version of C Sharp, which is modern and productive and the, the one that's up to date. You can also take your existing Windows desktop applications, update them to .NET Core 3, which will set you up for success. Uh, you can take applications that are older, 10, 15 years and move them. And then uh, one other thing to point out, since we talked about the .NET framework, we talked about Mono a little bit and .NET Core. In the future, in the future, we're going to merge them. We're going to merge them into what is going to end up being called .NET 5. That way you'll have one runtime that runs and works anywhere. And that one runtime will, uh, will work uh, with a single base class library that will allow your code to basically run anywhere. That unified platform will be coming in the next couple of years. But for now, here's a great slide that I want you to screenshot because this will tell you what the current plan is. It's actually very organized. We're going to have a different version of .NET every year, but every other year will be a long-term support version. This allows people and folks to plan. So I hope they a really good of uh, .NET and .NET Core. And uh, I think that's my time. How are we doing, friends, in uh, Kathmandu? Are you there, my friends? Jay and the team are getting ready to set us up for our next presenter here on the webinar. Uh, yeah, it's Scott. Uh, so uh, are you listening my voice? Yes, sir. Yeah, OK, so uh, can you show something on the Raspberry Pi? Uh, so it would be great. Yeah, let me see if I have some Raspberry Pi. Where's my Raspberry Pi? 
let me shut this down. Can you see my, my face only right now? There we are. Uh, I have to find, so I have some Raspberry Pis here. This is my office, it's a little messy. Um, this is a Raspberry Pi here, little tiny arcade, and I put a Raspberry Pi underneath. Not sure if you can see that okay. Yeah, there's we a Raspberry seen. Pi in here as well. But if you wait one second, I'm going to run over here and grab a Raspberry Pi. One sec. This is fun because it's live television. Here we go. Hang on. Hang on. I'm plugging it in. So in the meantime, if there is any question, so you can just type on the QA session. So Scott will be trying to uh, answer the question in the QA panel. It's on the left, right side. Sorry, I just put my headphones back on. Can you say again? If there is any question uh, oh, yeah. for the attendee, so you can just type on the QA panel. Yeah, I can't see the QA panel, so I should go over there. Yeah. So there is one question. Uh, Great. Yeah. So there is one question. So could you send your uh, Windows terminal profile dot JSON log uh, your Ubuntu thing? Yes. If I go into the Windows terminal, I'm going to share my screen again. Okay. So I'm going to go like this. And I'm going to hit settings. You can see my screen now. There we go. And when I click on settings, that's going to load that profile up. Let me close a few things. Here comes the profile. Loading, loading, loading. I think it's loading. I have many windows open. There we go. So here's my Windows terminal profile. I've got the dark theme. I've changed a few key bindings to make it so I can open tabs and close tabs certain ways. And they said they wanted to see Ubuntu. Yeah. That one is here. So I've got a color scheme that looks kind of nice. I'm using Fira code. I've changed my starting directory. And I changed the title of the tab. OK, now if I close the window here and let's go ahead and go back to seeing me just here. Here's a Raspberry Pi. Can you see OK? Yeah. So this device is called a crow pie, like a crow, like a blackbird, C-R-O-W. It's a Chinese company, and they have a Raspberry Pi, a touchscreen, and um, I've put this on the network here. So I should be able to open up my screen again. And go out back to the command line. Let's see if we can talk to it. There we go. So here I'm going to say SSH OPI. Uh, I need to remember the password. Let's find out. The pressure's on. There we go. So this is now the Raspberry Pi. So I have SSH into the Raspberry Pi that you asked for. OK. And then you can see I've got .NET on the Raspberry Pi. In this case, I believe it's .NET 2.2, you see. And within that, I've got a number of small uh, applications that I can run. These are some. Python ones, because with .NET, 
with with a, the with a crow pi, you can use Python or whatever. So, for example, I can print something out with Python and then uh, talk to an LCD. And then we can switch over to look at. That would look like in .NET. Which is here we go. Hello world .NET. LCD display. There we go. Um, let's see if I can run. The application and then I'll hold it back up and show you. OK, so I've just run this application. I'm going to turn off my screen sharing. I'm not sure if you can see it says hello .NET core on this LCD display right here. So we're now running .NET core on a Raspberry Pi and I'm outputting hello tech, tech webinar .NET core on my LCD display right here. So .NET really does run anywhere, anywhere. This is just a fun little box, but there's lots of other Raspberry Pis of different sizes. So yours might not look like this. It might look like this. Does that help my friend? You're muted. Yeah, OK, so it was nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Raspberry Pis are great. Yeah, so we can build a, a Raspberry Pi application using .NET Core. Yeah, it's very great. You can use uh, it. So we have another question. Uh, okay. So when is that uh, termin terminal feature uh, releasing? So by Rocky. Say that again. When is that terminal feature re releasing? Which thing? I'm I'm confused. Which uh, I. So you should have the function. Sorry, I'm having trouble with the audio is echoing. Uh, can you say again? I apologize. OK, so please uh, go to QA session, then uh, you'll see the question. So all right, let me go to the QA session. Yeah. Tech webinar T tiny CC. Well, it wants to open on teams, I'm afraid. Uh, on your teams also, there is a live event QA. You can view the. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. Question. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Where is the QA? I'm trying to learn how to use Teams. You're going to teach me how to use Teams, my friend. <laughs> so when I click on the QA in my Teams, it doesn't do anything. Okay. You see here? So uh, uh, let's move on to another question. So what's the difference between .NET and ASP.NET? So this is asked by Arjun. Oh, here we go. Oh, when is the terminal feature releasing? So yeah. this terminal, Windows terminal, is available now. You have this already. So you can go out and go like this. Search for Windows terminal. It's open source. It's free. It's been out since June. It will be probably released 1.0 uh, maybe next year sometime. You can go actually up to GitHub and look at their release notes. You can be downloading it like now if you wish. Um, but yeah, you'll be able to get Windows Terminal now and then 1.0 perhaps next year sometime. Now ASP.NET versus .NET is, is this. Let me show you. So .NET is kind of the runtime itself or .NET Core, it's the runtime. ASP.NET Core is the web application. Now, there's lots of different ways to write web applications. ASP.NET is just one. Razor is one, Blazor is one, Web Forms, MVC, Web API. There's lots and lots of choices. Our next presenter is going to show us how to make applications with Blazor. Blazor sits on top of, sits on, sits on. So that, I think that's a good explanation right there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good question. 
Okay, so uh, Scott, uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. So we'll be having our next speaker, Zimri Likeness. So he will be delivering on Blazor about the web assembly and SPA framework <laughs> that how we can build using the Blazor. And uh, thank you, Scott Hanselman. And have a great day. Thanks. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye bye.